but uh, this doesn't quite cut it as a proof. It's attractive and we've got the intuition now laid out, but it's not enough because I've sort of intuited based on the question and the result that I've been asked to prove that you, ha you have to go up, right? That's what I expect this, this wants us to do. But I don't actually know that for certain because if, for example, you think about moving from this um, value here, we said that you've got an X value of three, and then uh, as you move to the right, this graph's going up, this graph's going down, and I expect that that means when I add them, it's going to increase, right? But you need to know that the amount that you're increasing by here is going to be bigger than the amount that you're decreasing by here. Now, you can sort of see because my graph is roughly the right shape because of this hyperbolic structure that we got, you can see, oh, that looks ish, like it's going to be increasing more than this is decreasing and that's why you have a total increase. But you don't actually know that. You actually have to say, can I prove that to be the case? What knowledge do I have access to which can tell me how quickly things are increasing or how quickly things are decreasing? That's right, you, you made the connection. I'm gonna to need to appeal to some calculus here, right? I've gotta show that this gradient here um, is going to overtake this gradient down here and that's why you have a total increase and the reverse is true on the other side, okay? So this doesn't constitute a proof by itself, but it does give us a map in our head of where we need to go. I need to show essentially that at this spot right here, that has to be a minimum turning point. That's what I'm after, right? If I can justify that, then I can say, oh, well, therefore that's the lowest you can go. And you're just going up from there. Um, and therefore you can say um, that this graph, the object once graphed will be greater than or equal to two thirds across its relevant domain, which is between naught and six. So you can see why, like I said, this is not as efficient as our previous algebraic method. If you know what to do algebraically, Algebra is often the most efficient way, um, but I still think it's really useful to try and push on this and see how we can structure a proof around it. So now we know what to do, how do we go about this? Well, I'm gonna take uh, this statement here, right? And I'm going to work on this with calculus and see what we can get from it, right? So I've got y, um, and I'll just, whoopsie daisy, didn't need to zoom like that. Um, I'm going to put that, to make it easier to differentiate, I'm going to put that into index form. So I've got a to the power of negative one, plus six minus a to the power of negative one, and now we are ready to go. It's not gonna be dy on dx like we usually get, it's dy on dA, and uh, off we go. Let's start to differentiate. So I'm gonna get, in the first instance, uh, minus a to the power of negative two, brought the power out the front and then reduced the power by one. Same deal here for the next term, but I'm also gonna have, um, I'm gonna have chain rule going on, so function of function. So here comes the derivative of the outside. Uh, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm going to have that power come out the front. I will reduce the power by one, and then I multiply by the inside derivative, because I just did the outside derivative. And conveniently for me, um, being that the inside function is six minus a, the inside derivative is negative one. So I'm gonna get some um, handy dandy canceling here and here. That's nice to know. So what do I got? I've got negative one on a squared. I just said that those two negatives will cancel, so I get plus, and then I've got one over six minus a squared. All right, so um, I'm trying to show that I have a stationary point here, right? I haven't had a question that's told me, find, uh, de you know, locate stationary points and determine their nature, but I've decided that that's what I need to do. So therefore, um, I'm gonna get this in a form that makes it easier for me to identify stationary points. Let's combine these two fractions into one. For starters, common denominator, so I'll put that uh, minus six minus a squared over there, and then I'm gonna go plus a squared on that side, all divided by, uh, what have I got here? So um, a squared, six minus a all squared on the denominator. That looks good. Really all I need to worry about is the numerator when I'm trying to solve for the first derivative being equal to zero. So let's leave the denominator in that sort of factorize -y form and work on this uh, uh, numerator here. So I've got uh, minus outside of, let's see, I'm gonna get 36 minus 12a plus a squared, and then I'm gonna add a squared. And as I pointed out, nothing is gonna change on the denominator. Things are looking good if you remember where we're headed, because remember I'm anticipating a stationary point here at a equals three, and maybe you're about to see what's gonna happen here, right? This a squared is actually, there's a minus sign attached to it um, from out the front. And so it's gonna cancel with this a squared, which is positive, and so that leaves us with, minus sign will attach here, 
This will flip around with a double negative, so I'm gonna write that out the front. 12a minus 36, and then I've got all this stuff on the denominator, which is not that interesting to me, uh, at least not yet. So, hooray, I have a first derivative. And remember what I'm looking for is a turning point, right? So I can say turning points uh, may occur. You can't say they're turning points yet, even if you solve for um, when that first derivative is equal to zero, because you could get a horizontal point of inflection, which is not a turning point. So they may occur when that first derivative dy on dA equals zero. I'm gonna disregard the denominator because no matter what the denominator is equal to, it will never make the whole thing equal to zero. So in other words, I'm just looking at the 12a minus 36. And as we anticipated, you're going to divide through by 12 and get, lo and behold, a equals three. Hooray, that was what I was hoping for on my uh, graph that I got it. So it's nice to know that our intuition and graphical approach has sent us in the right direction. I haven't actually shown that this is what I want, that it's a minimum turning point. So I've got a turning point occurring there. Um, and of course I can put that in to get a Y coordinate, um, which I will do in a second, though I already know its value. Um, but I look back from my potential turning point and I say, I've got a choice. I can either um, do a neighborhood test, check the derivative on one side versus the other, and then show it's you know decreasing zero and then increasing with regard to gradient, or I can do second derivative, right? And then show something about concavity. When I look at this derivative here, do I want to differentiate this again? And the answer is no thank you. Um, to do quotient rule on this looks like it's going to be more trouble than it's worth. And I think it's going to be fairly easy to do the substitutions. So I'm going to check the neighborhood. So check nearby values. And in this context, um, you know, checking on either side just by one unit. So a equals two, a equals four, that should be more than sufficient. So um, a equals two, what's that going to give us? dy on dA is gonna be equal to, when you substitute that in, you're gonna get up the top there, 24 take away 36, all divided by, um, let's see, two squared is four, and then six minus a is four, but then that gets squared, so that's gonna be 16. So I'm getting minus 12 on 64, which I know I can cancel, but I don't need to because that is going to be less than zero, i.e. being this is the first derivative, this is decreasing, okay, as I was hoping. And then I just need to rinse and repeat for the other side of my potential turning point. So I'm gonna check A equals four, and uh, there goes dy on dA. And unsurprisingly, because of the symmetry of this, uh, 12A is gonna be 48. That looks familiar. Take away 36. Um, here on the denominator, uh, instead of getting four times 16, uh, test it out for yourself when you can see what the denominator is going to be equal to, you're gonna get a squared, which is four. So it's gonna be 16 times four. So that looks familiar. And that gives us 12 on 64, which just like before, I don't need to simplify further because that's enough to say it's positive. In other words, it's increasing. Okay, so what have I got here? Uh, if you want, you can draw yourself a quick table of values. For values of a versus dy on dA, you're getting from two to three to four. Um, we had this negative 12, then the zero, then the 12. So you can clearly see the shape that we were anticipating earlier. So there's the decreasing zero and then the increasing. So that's fantastic. So I should tidy this up because that looks a bit messy, doesn't it? There you go. Actually put a table around your table of values. What a novel idea. There you go, that's a little easier to read. And so I can say, um, therefore, uh, you know, I'm gonna put the coordinates now here, right? A equals three, and it's fairly straightforward to see. Uh, we're extension two students. I think we can say by inspection at this point. And when you put three in here and three in here, you're getting like we anticipated graphically before, a third plus a third. So that will give me two thirds is a relative minimum. Now, we do need to point out, because remember, this is a proof, just because it's a relative minimum doesn't mean it's the minimum. So we should actually state there are two things that need to be taken into account to show that this relative minimum is absolutely the minimum within this domain. The first thing is, within this domain from naught to six, there's no discontinuities. You notice that? Um, I've actually got a discontinuity right on one side at zero and the other at six. And the reason why that's important is because if you had some graph that looked like this, 
Uh, it's a weird looking thing, but there's a discontinuity there. And I asked you, hey, where's the minimum, right? You could find by calculus what this location was. You could show that it decreased, then zero, and then increased, but it's not the absolute minimum because this discontinuity means that on the other side, you have no idea what's going on, right? So there's, there's you know, there is no minimum to this function because it just goes down forever. So firstly, you need to say there are no discontinuities. And then secondly, so I'm gonna say, but in this domain, from naught to six, um, let's say that before we forget it, um, the, the function is continuous. Um, the other thing you need to know is that there are no other turning points, right? Because if we were to find some other, like we found a relative minimum, if we found a relative maximum somewhere, what that would imply is that here's the minimum, but then the maximum turns around and that means you can drop even further. Um, you know, this part of the graph is lower than this part of the graph, right? So therefore I need to know there are no other turning points, which I can say off of this solution path here. You see, you've got that linear function on the numerator, only gonna have one solution, one zero, so the function is continuous and there are no other st uh, turning points. No other stationary points means there's no other turning points in this context. No other turning points. That's what I get for talking and writing at the same time. So therefore, um, it is an absolute minimum as well. And you know, ordinarily, you know, if the question was to uh, locate stationary points and determine their nature. This kind of detail might not be necessary, but I have to, I think it's, you know, the, the onus is on me to say this because this is a proof question, right? I need to show beyond a shadow of a doubt that two thirds is the bottom and I have to be greater than or equal to that value, right? So therefore I can say one over a plus one over six minus a has to be greater than or equal to two thirds within this domain from naught to six, and then I'll conclude by back substituting. I put in six minus a, so I could turn this into a function of a, um, but therefore I can say that a, or the six over a rather, is actually b, um, and that is the result that I was tasked with proving as required, full stop. So, in conclusion, what can we say here? Um, this is a delightful question and a, a lovely way to solve it, I think, even though, yes, I know it's a little bit long because we had to pull out some fairly heavy-handed tools to do it, um, but a few things to say. Number one, it is always valuable to push on a mathematical object to say, if this is one way to solve it, um, is there another? Because you didn't know from the outset that this would be um, slower. I, I did because I've done this before. Um, but you know, you may see a solution and then see another one and think, well, which one is the way to go? And by practicing this and getting fluency and sort of sensing, oh, okay, I actually have other tools at my disposal here that might be useful, um, you may end up stumbling upon a solution that is faster. Um, secondly, uh, there are going to be other, you know, tasks where uh, other questions where going to this visual and calculus approach is not just faster. It might be the only way that is immediately obvious, or the question itself might sort of lean you in that direction. It might say, like, here's, uh, you know, part A, uh, find this derivative, and then part B, some inequality appears, and you're like, whoa, what's the connection between these? Uh, and this might be it. Okay. Uh, and lastly, I just want to point out, I think it's delightful that a tool that we've developed um, and, and learned to understand, which is, you know, differentiation, finding stationary points, all that kind of thing, the question itself said nothing about differentiation or finding turning points, determining their nature. This is a skill that you're used to applying because someone asks you to, but here it's a skill that we can apply because it is useful to us. When you want to show that something is going to be greater than or equal to something, you can find its lowest value and show that it has to turn around there and there's going to be no way it can go beneath it. Uh, and calculus rates of change gradient is what helps us understand that. So I hope you found that uh, method of solution insightful uh, and that it's useful for um, tackling questions in the future and just general problem solving skills.